Our Human Rights is a program about taking human rights action. The objective of Our Human Rights is to motivate people to take positive and peaceful action in support of human rights. Programs highlight how human rights abuses impact us all and how we can do something about it. Our Human Rights focuses on the human rights policies of the United States. U.S. government support for and abuse of human rights impacts the safety of American citizens as well as actions by the rest of the world. There are countries that are committing far worse human rights abuses than the U.S. However, considering the extent of U.S. influence on many countries, U.S. policies in particular should be a positive example for the world. As a team, we produce a show that educates viewers about pressing human rights issues and advocates and encourages positive action to uphold human rights, which are defined by internationally agreed upon laws and standards, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We will cover human rights events, interview experts, officials in the field, human rights defenders, victims, artists, and average citizens to raise the profile of the most important human rights issues facing society today. We believe that supporting human rights is patriotic and based on American values. We believe that every person can make a difference. We believe that you can make a difference. Every episode of Our Human Rights will show a few actions that can be taken by individuals just like you to support stronger, safer, and a more moral America. We cover the pressing human rights issues of the day and what you can do about them. Human rights are under threat. The ban on torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment is being undermined. In the war on terror, governments are not only using torture, they're making the case that this is justifiable and necessary. Human rights organizations have found that the abuses which took place in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq by U.S. forces was not an aberration. They are part of a pattern where versions of interrogation techniques developed for use in Afghanistan and the Guantanamo Bay prison later emerged in Iraq. Torture is prohibited in all circumstances under international humanitarian law, the body of law applicable in armed conflict. To suggest that they might be justified in some circumstances is based on a premise that the end justifies the means. This is a rationale similar to that often used in an attempt to justify acts of terrorism. The United States influences governments everywhere, and if our government and military commit torture, we give comfort to those who commit torture routinely and undermine the very values the war on terror is supposed to defend. So we are uh, here today, it's uh, uh, June the 26th is the International Day has been declared some nine, nine years ago by the United Nations as the International Day of Solidarity with victims of torture. Uh, you know, I mean, we may not even have the same political opinions or come from the same social class or, uh, you know, one is a teacher, one is this, he's an artist, uh, uh, I teach English, uh, you know, it's, we're all from a, a variety, we're ordinary people, uh, you know, that have been persecuted because all of us, together with many who are not disabled, we wanted to see a just society, we want to see a different society. Torture is wrong, and the United States' involvement in torture is a disgrace, and we simply oppose it. There are many ways we try to oppose torture in the world and the torture which the Bush administration has implemented. This is our way of saying publicly, uh, it must stop. I think there's no question that the outsourcing of torture is a perfect name for what extraordinary rendition really is. Uh, we, th we find the practice to be completely unlawful. Uh, it essentially bases itself in, secretly, in secrecy, in operating outside of the law, outside of any kind of judicial review, where people are picked up, they're bundled onto an airplane, sometimes drugged, shackled, taken somewhere where they don't know where they are, sometimes their family doesn't know where they are, uh, at times transported to places even from which they were seeking asylum. 
and then put into prisons where they're frequently tortured, uh, sometimes held just on mistaken identity. And so it basically is a way of taking people into custody outside of any of the traditional safeguards that would keep innocent people in from going into custody, that would keep people from being tortured, and that would prevent human rights abuses. The United States has not transported anyone and will not transport anyone to a country when he, we believe he will be tortured. Where appropriate, the United States seeks assurances that transferred persons will not be tortured. Ultimately, diplomatic assurances are worthless. Um, no country, whether it's, an America, whether, whether it's the United States or France or Egypt or Saudi Arabia, is going to let you inside their prisons to see how they're handling their prisoners. And what we're doing, as most of you know, with the extraordinary renditions, we're not only putting the people on our own plane after seizing them off the streets of Milan or the, the airport in Sweden, we pick them up, we put them on our own planes, we fly them to another country, we turn them over with a list of questions the CIA wants answered, and we keep money going, and often the CIA person is there helping advise what kind of more information they want. If that's not conspiracy, I don't know what is. Well, Human Rights First thinks that it's, it's a fundamental problem to hold individuals in secret um, and provide them no access to any sort of humanitarian organizations and not to tell anybody that they're being detained. Um, this is a, viola a clear violation of international human rights standards. It can also be a violation of international humanitarian law. I think the United States has used the secret prisons and has justified the secret prisons by saying you know, when you have very high-value detainees that you have to question, that you, they can't have interference from the outside world and they can't be scrutinized. I think the reality of the situation is whenever you have that kind of secrecy, whenever you disappear people, it's always a recipe for human rights violations. And this has actually been uh, the subject of public debate. What the administration wants to call alternative interrogation techniques, which are widely thought to be techniques like waterboarding or the cold room technique where somebody is put in a room that's around 50 degrees and repeatedly doused with cold water, uh, sleep deprivation, stress positions, using some of the tactics that the United States themselves calls torture in their country report on human rights when they look at it being done in other countries. And so for those of us in the human rights field, it seems like nothing more than a cynical attempt than to take these people, put them outside the reach of the law, and to use techniques that would never be acceptable in a U.S. prison system. Guantanamo Bay at this point has become the epitome of every bad policy that the United States has engaged in pursuant to the war on terror. If you look at Guantanamo right now, you have over 400 men, some who have been held for almost five years now, the vast majority without charge. Some of the men in Guantanamo were rendered to other countries and tortured before being brought to Guantanamo. Some of them are facing, only 10 of them actually currently are charged, facing trial by an unfair system that actually gives less rights to foreign nationals, which is a violation of our com uh, U.S. commitments under the Convention to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination, and some of them were the disappeared, who have certainly suddenly reappeared and been put in Guantanamo. So every bad policy the U.S. has engaged engaged in, not to mention the types of interrogation techniques that broach the line of torture, if not cruel and human degrading treatment, are all epitomized by Guantanamo. In fact, one of the techniques we're using in Guantanamo that the FBI thought was too bad to even participate in is called short shackling, and it was banned by the by the UN several years ago. And it's a combination of sensory assaults. You bolt the person's hands and feet to the floor, leave them for 20 hours with no clothing and no toilet privileges, with the temperatures going way up and then way down, and blasting, blasting stereo music that's just almost deafening and strobe lights in their face. And the FBI people said they were coming in and finding people unconscious in a pool of filth the next day. The fact remains that treatment is proper, and there's no doubt in my mind that it is humane and, and appropriate and consistent with the Geneva Convention for the most part. Remember, these are the ones in Guantanamo Bay are killers. Uh, they, are, uh, uh, they don't share the same values we share. In both the theoretical sense and the very practical sense, it needs to be closed. It needs to be closed symbolically because it really has, com it has come to highlight all U.S. abuses under the war on terror, but also in the practical sense because it's unacceptable to say that you could pick up people and hold them as recently a, a Department of Defense de official said, that you could hold them for the rest of their natural lives without ever charging them, without ever trying them, or giving them any opportunity to challenge their detention. If the United States abandons this commitment, what hope do we have uh, on upholding other governments um, to account? 
um, Senator McCain and Senator Graham when they introduced the amendment was that the problem about anyone uh, beginning to use um, torture, uh, and especially if it, if it seems to be a norm within our own country, that it endangers our troops ultimately. And this seems to be uh, a prophetic example of that. Uh, we lead best when we lead with example. Uh, and that example should be a good one. And I believe it can be a good one. And that's what the American people uh, really want. On October 17, 2006, some five years after 9-1-1, President Bush signed the Military Commissions Act of 2006 into law. The recent Military Commissions Act of 2006 that was passed by Congress was a disaster for human rights, I think, from beginning to end. And if you look at what it did, it did set up a second-tier system of justice that applies only to foreign nationals that would allow into evidence, uh, evidence that was obtained through cruel and human degrading treatment or coercion, which isn't allowed into U.S. courts, which isn't allowed into U.S. military courts. It set up a very broad definition of who qualifies as an unlawful enemy combatant that takes away any notion of a combatant being attached to an armed conflict or a battlefield. It could be any person anywhere on the planet, absent an armed conflict, absent any association with an armed conflict. And that's a real concern because what that does is that then eliminates the human rights, um, the human rights framework entirely and puts forth the idea that you can pick up any person anywhere, any time, and then hold them indefinitely pursuant to a vague law of war theory. When the law of war was an exceptional portion of the law that was intended to apply to an armed conflict. The law expands the definition of combatant to include those who have purposefully and materially supported hostilities against the United States, even if they have not taken part in the hostilities themselves, and even if they are arrested far from the battlefield. An example could even encompass somebody who unknowingly contributed money to a charitable arm of a terrorist organization. These definitions have essentially been invented by the administration and Congress. They have no basis in international law and undermine one of the most fundamental pillars of the Geneva Conventions, the distinction between combatants who engage in hostilities and are subject to attack and non-combatants. The way that the Military Commissions Act of 2006 defines unlawful enemy combatant is clearly overbroad. Um, it, it includes citizens and it also includes individuals that provide material support to, um, to individuals that engage in um, aggression against or hostilities against the United States. Normally, um, military commissions are only used to try individuals in armed conflict. You know, people who are brought in off the battlefield. That's the idea of what mil the appropriate use of a military commissions is. Uh, the idea that just an individual that's engaged in what is essentially a crime of, say, providing material support, um, w which has its own problems as far as being a vague term, um, that's much more appropriate for perhaps a criminal court system, civil system, um, domestic system to be dealing with, not a military commission. Uh, the bill also takes away the right to go to court for all U.S. Or detainees in U.S. custody, foreign nationals that are in U.S. custody. It strips those currently in custody of the right to file claims of habeas corpus, meaning just the basic and most fundamental protection of challenging their detention before a court, which essentially allows the U.S. government to continue to hold them arbitrarily. Uh, it also takes away the right to follow um, any kind of follow-up claim. So there can be no reparations. There can be no claim made under the Alien Tort Claims Act or claims for reparation for people who may have been arbitrarily detained and tortured. And so that in and of itself is a huge concern, just completely cutting the courts out of the picture. Um, there's just so many pieces of the act that, that really do cause concern, including parts that would that seem to offer retroactive immunity to people who may have been involved in war crimes, U.S. agents who may have been involved in war crimes. The Military Commissions Act of 2006 extends these court stripping prohibitions and makes them retroactive and applicable to non-citizens in U.S. custody anywhere in the world. The law even grants immunity to those who have committed torture before December 2005, thereby preventing justice from ever being pursued. I think what it does that should be of great concern is one of the best protections against human rights violation is to have access to courts, access to judicial review, access to family and attorneys, to have some kind of outside um, check on the system. 
And by removing all of that, it creates a huge concern as to what's happening to people in custody because they have no avenue to make complaints and they have no avenue to get their situation corrected. So if something is happening, nobody would ever know. And we've always known that secrecy is what surrounds some of the worst human rights violations. One has to realize that you don't know if somebody has engaged in terrorism. You don't know that you're torturing a terrorist. You don't know that you're detaining a terrorist. If that individual hasn't been able to, um, to explain themselves in full, um, if that individual has been, hasn't been given the opportunity to state why they're not a terrorist, why they haven't engaged in any hostility, why they are being unjustly detained, uh, that, that that process is really essential. Um, I think that that's, that's really important to remember that we can't say, well, all, it's clear that all the people being detained in Guantanamo are not terrorists. There are many innocent individuals who have been detained there. Um, and that, that that needs to be addressed. The idea of uh, innocent till proven guilty is, is very core uh, to c civil liberties and human rights standards. Of course, uh, organizations like Human Rights First believe that terrorists should be prosecuted. And we have a system for prosecuting terrorists. And we have prosecuted terrorists successfully um, within our own civilian court system. And we certainly encourage these types of prosecutions to continue. Terrorism is a violation of, human, of individuals' human rights. Um, we condemn any acts of terrorism, and we believe that those engaged should definitely be prosecuted. Um, but they, but the, the uh, due process of the justice system needs to be preserved. We can all hope and pray that uh, torture may soon be abolished uh, worldwide. In my judgment, there's no higher calling than what you're doing here. Every member of Congress should be required to meet with victims of torture and to hear their stories firsthand. There's a great deal that people can do. I mean, I think many times people think to themselves, well, what does one postcard do? What does one signature do? I mean, the point is that it's never just one postcard or one signature. It's the collective efforts of our members and their friends and their communities across the countries that help push for legislation like the McCain Amendment, which made quite clear that the ban on cruel and human degrading treatment applied all over the world, not just in the U.S., as the administration had asserted. And that if you were in a military facility, you couldn't use any kind of interrogation technique that wasn't specifically approved by the Army Field Manual, which now explicitly prohibits many of the things we saw in Abu Ghraib and other places. And so all of these things come not just by one court case and not just by one attorney or one piece of legislation, but really the collective efforts of people all over the country who are working to educate their communities, whether that means their religious communities, their school community, their local community, uh, conversations around the dinner table, taking public actions uh, to educate people, to draw attention to the matter, engaging their elected officials. All of these things feed into a larger movement in which we've really been able to shift the debate back from sort of the fear of terrorism to what is acceptable, what is lawful, and what is the best way to address these issues. Through Amnesty International, certainly you can go on our website, www.amnestyusa.org. Uh, if you're interested in these issues in particular, you can go to the Denounce Torture webpage. There's so many ways to take action at many different levels that people can get involved to the extent that they have capacity, which could be anything from signing a pledge or sending a letter to hosting a community forum or a teach-in to visiting their member of Congress's office or their senator's office and making their voice heard. There's always a wide range of activities, but I really do encourage people to log on and at least do something. I think that the best thing that viewers can do is to contact their representatives and to tell their representatives that they don't think it's okay that the executive branch is able to hold people indefinitely without charging them and that those individuals would have no recourse in the courts and that their representatives and their senators need to do something about that. So I think that really contacting, contacting your senators, contacting rep your representatives, letting them know that you care about this issue, that that this is not how you want your country to be representing itself internationally. Um, it's probably the best thing that you can do uh, to change the international perception of the United States at this, at this point in time. Thank you. Only five to seven percent of people in a congressional district, and there's 600,000 people in every congressional district, only five to seven percent take advantage of the opportunity to speak to a member of Congress. And most of that is through these blast emails that we see. Three other things that, that 
we usually cover is the ABCs. We want to serve as an accurate uh, source of information for them so they can rely on us and they can say, all right, I received this information about extraordinary renditions, the person was credible, um, and uh, gave me information that I can use. Uh, the second thing, these staffers are very busy, so we want to drop off a couple pages of information, tell them the reasons why, why we uh, feel strongly about this legislation. And finally, uh, we want to be courteous. Um, and this one, I think, is very important uh, in all of our human rights work, uh, and particularly when, when we're working with difficult offices, um, because, well, for a couple of reasons. <laughs> one of the reasons is because some of these offices don't agree with us on some of these issues, but they will on others. Um, and we, we want to make sure that we are in a position uh, that, that we, can, we can get their support um, on the next on the next issue, we we want to make sure that uh, they don't think these people are these people are just jerks. Um, we can we can disagree with them, but we need to do that. You know, we need to do that in a in a courteous, uh, civil method. You're gonna you're gonna get your representative, or your senator, on board as a co-sponsor by being accurate and brief and courteous and specific and persistent. Um, but, you know, in particular, really, because you're, you're persistent, you're following up. So what I really strongly suggest you do is you leave yourself an opening to follow up with the staff later. Right? Go, look, I have some information on this I'd like to send to you. Uh, can I call you in two weeks and see where things stand? Because what you want to do is not just to walk in and walk out and you're done and they forget about you fairly quickly, because they see a number of people every day. You want to walk in and start establishing a bit of a relationship. So by leaving yourself an opening, what you can do is send them the information, pick up the phone, call them, by the way, we met a week ago and I just sent you the information, I wanted to make sure you get it. What do you think about it? And you're starting a conversation that stays in the front of their mind. But it's really each of us on the level taking on our conscience and to struggle and not to accept and to believe that torture and assassination isn't, can never be justified.